you all very much for coming out. This is a great turnout. Uh, you know, Bioware has a great history in video gaming, and we, I say this everywhere because I'm part of the community team. We have the best community, too. <laughs> uh, we're here today from Bioware. We're from Bioware Edmonton and one visitor from Bioware Montreal to talk to you about Mass Effect. We're going to be talking uh, a little bit. We've got a presentation and something to show you as well, but we are going to have time for questions from fans at the end. We've got a few questions from uh, fans through Twitter, Facebook, the Bioware Social Network we're going to address, but we want to be here to answer your questions as well. Uh, my name is Chris Priestley. I am part of the community team at Bioware. I want to thank these five guys that have come out. Uh, I know there's a lot of fans and love and affection for Mass Effect right now. <laughs> it would be really easy for them to hide and stay at home and not want to talk to fans. <laughs> we love Thank you. Too. <laughs> but they were brave enough to come out. They want to talk to you know everybody that's got questions about the game because we're really proud of the Mass Effect series. That's why we're here. We love the games that we make and we love our fans. So we're going to talk about Mass Effect 3 today. I'll introduce my fellow panelists and then I'll turn them over. Uh, I have Mike Gamble, producer for Mass Effect. <laughs> Alex El Sayad, he's a level designer. Reed Buckmaster, Reed is senior QA. John Dumbro. John is a writer, senior writer now. Senior. senior writer now. And Patrick Weeks, another writer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Uh, he's got some stuff to tell you. All right. Test, can you hear me in the back? Great. Good, good. Well, damn. I mean, uh, we really filled this place. So again, thanks to everyone for, for standing in line, uh, waiting, um, coming out to ask questions and support us and, and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, Mass Effect 3 was a labor of love for, for the dev team, and uh, we're extremely privileged to be here. We, we developed Mass Effect 3 over a couple of years, um, and we, we, we did it across Edmonton and Montreal. There, there's a talented team in Montreal who, who worked on a lot of amazing stuff that you saw in the game. Uh, most of us are from Edmonton. Alex here is, is representing the Bioware Montreal studio. And, and we're just really, really stoked to be here. Um, no lie, uh, the fans, the community is really what makes us um, work that extra little bit and, and we really appreciate it. So in general, uh, I kind of want to get a feel for the audience first of all by a show of hands. Whose favorite game was Mass Effect 1? Okay. All right. What about 2? Whoa. So, okay. What about 3? So you guys just want to talk about Mass Effect 2 for the next hour? <laughs> um, and what about multiplayer? Who here plays multiplayer? Awesome, awesome. Good, good. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, Geth or Corian? Geth first. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna assume that that both is probably the the answer that everyone prefers. Okay. Okay, and Femshep or Broshep, which one? <laughs> okay. All in favor of Femshep, raise your hand. All right, that's not bad. So that's 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 pretty even. Good. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So we're going to do things kind of really informally today. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A. We don't have like a slide deck or something like that for you. We'll just talk a little bit about the dev process. I'm going to start out with talking a little bit about DLC. So my role right now is, is producer for the DLC for ME3. So I'm extremely close to it. And I, I think that we're going to be able to offer a lot in the next year. Uh, Mass Effect 2 was extremely successful with the DLC and now because of the addition of the Montreal team we're able to do more, um, bigger, larger, more. And so the next year is going to be pretty exciting. We talked about a couple DLCs over the last you know, two days. Uh, one was announced Thursday morning, the extended cut. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that one later. Um, 
and, and we did bring protection, so. <laughs> 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 and then the Resurgence uh, DLC was announced this morning, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, because you're probably camped out in lines at PAX, uh, but we have a new trailer that we'd like to show to you, so load it up, guys. <laughs> there's, there's no nudity in the trailer, so don't worry. <laughs> Uh, two things I want to call out about that. Uh, available next week, Tuesday, so go everyone here, get it, and, and play. Um, but there's also the whole free thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to keep you know, you guys happy and, and you know, keep the discs in the tray essentially and, and we want to extend out the life of Mass Effect 3 as much as possible. We understand there's great value for both the player and for us for you to do that, so um, that's, that's our focus. So that's, that's multiplayer for the time being. Um, so single player. Um. <laughs> okay. Still. <laughs> so Thursday we announced the extended cut. Um, now, you know, to, to be clear, the extended cut is not a reimagining of the endings or a new ending. Um, but, but there are a number of things that we, we made sure that we wanted to do with it. And, you know, we're currently building it right now. Our, our uh, cinematics team, uh, led by Paris Lay, is, is, is on it as we speak. Um, the writers, um, including two of the writers at the end of the table, um, are, are heavily involved. And uh, uh, it, it's coming together. Now, we wanted to... We wanted to clarify a number of things for the players. We wanted to make sure that we actually answered the questions that we're seeing. Um, we, we're all on Twitter, we're on you know, the, the social networks. We may not you know, tweet necessarily or respond or engage in, in conversation, but we definitely look, we definitely um, put together the lists. You know, so the community team, with the help of Jessica and Chris, um, feed us the information that you guys are, 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 the questions that you guys have. And so because of that, that's how we're going to take the direction for the extended Cut deal. So we want to give some more closure around some of the questions you have, um, fill some of the unknowns, uh, and, and in general, we really wanted to give the players um, a sense of personalization with the ending. So you know, uh, many people mentioned that some of the choices that were within the game are not ne not necessarily reflected in the ending scenes. We're definitely going to focus on things like that. We want to make sure that when you see the ending of Mass Effect, you now have the information and the context to feel satisfied. Um, and in general, we're really excited to be doing it. So bear with us over the next couple months while we work on it. Uh, and it will come out, again, it will come out free. Um, and currently, we're, we're shooting for a, a generic summer 
release, but we're, we're going to put the time and the effort into it that it takes. We're not going to rush it, um, but it's going to be done well. It's, it's more than just a few cinematic scenes. It's more than just, you know, a, a small coat of paint. It is definitely a, uh, a considerable amount, and so we're happy to be doing it. And so with that, I believe, Chris, there were some questions related to that? Yeah, uh, we're going to open it up to questions of everybody here in the room, but we had some come through our social media channels, the BioWare Social Network, our Twitter and our Facebook feeds. And we know these are pretty popular questions. We know a lot of you probably have the same sort of questions. So we're going to kind of cover some of them right at the start. And then, as we said, we'll open up the room later. Hopefully, we'll have provided the answer you're looking for. We'll see where we go for. Uh, the first, Mike, you already kind of touched on it, uh, is will the new extended cut provide new endings to the Mass Effect franchise? Yeah, uh, so basically, you already talked about that one, like, no, no new endings, but we want to provide closure. Okay, uh, the next question about that is, why was that content not in the game at launch? You know, the, the dev team stands by what we release in the core product. Um, we're very proud of it. And, um, well, thanks. I, it was important, though, like, like most things that we do for us to, to listen to the community. And, you know, a lot of the community uh, feedback obviously didn't come until the game came out. And once we were listening, once we've heard, um, then we've decided to move on the extended cut. So, really, we couldn't have included it in the game because we didn't know there was such a, a huge demand for it, to be honest with you. So. How does Bioware feel about the response from the fans? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's a that's a loaded a loaded gun question. <laughs> Just kidding. You know what? Um, anytime anyone has constructive criticism, we've always welcomed it, and I'm sure you know there are always the few in, in the entire lot that are are you know not as constructive as possible. But we 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 honestly don't let it you know, make us jaded. We, we still understand that there's a lot of valuable feedback to be provided. Um, you know, even today we were presented with an entire book of valuable feedback. <laughs> a gorgeous book. Yeah, a gorgeous book. Um, and again, I mean, we, we still welcome it. So yeah, keep it coming. And there's nothing stopping you guys, so. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit about this. Uh, I talk to the dev team a lot as I'm part of the community team reading the Bioware social network and everything. And whether it's support or whether it's anger, whether it's, you know, love or rage, whatever it is, we get it from you fans because you care about the game. That's why we get it from you. It, for us, really, it would be awesome if you know, you bought the game and went, wow, that's the best game of all time, and then waited for the next DLC. But we know reality, that's probably not going to happen all the time. <laughs> but when we get the feedback, like Mike said, the dev team is listening, we're reading forums, we're reading Twitter, we're reading media reviews, we're, we're reading what the fans have to say. It matters to us, and it helps make us make better games in DLC. So we thank you very much for your feedback. Uh, the next question uh, has to do with Tally's face. <laughs> it, it's kind of a two-part question. One, uh, why did we choose to show Tally's face at all in the game? And then two, why was it how it looked? <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, the first question is, is quite obvious. A lot of people were basically wondering what Tally's face looked like, and, and we wanted to do it in a, in a tasteful um, way that didn't necessarily throw it into the game engine. We thought that a gift from, from Tally, you know, in, in the form of a picture is probably the most appropriate way to do it. Um, yeah, and in, in terms of what Tally's face looked like and why it looked the way it was, we, we often use uh, source material, source art for, for many things within our game. Um, in the case of Tally's face, we, we wanted something to be photorealistic. We wanted the, the level of fidelity to be there. We wanted the color to be right. We wanted to essentially make it as close as a picture as possible. And it's not like it's the first picture that we stumbled across. We just used, we poured through thousands and thousands of pieces of source art to, to kind of lock in. Plus there was the artistic vision. And so we were able to essentially combine those two into what you guys saw as Tally's face. Um, we, you know, we've, hey, we've done it throughout, you know? Yeah, is, if, if I could jump in for yeah, a second. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Could, I don't know if she's still here, uh, could all the Samara cosplayers stand up? I see one. I don't know if the other one is ac uh, actually ah, stayed here. There she is. There, there she is at the back. And if I remember correctly, you are the face model for Samara. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's Rana McNear. Uh, she's the face model for Samara and is a great example of how a real face can make it into Mass Effect. Yeah. So, Liara, her face is based on a real face model. Um, same Shepard. goes for Commander Shepard, same goes for Miranda, obviously, Yvonne Strahovski. And we really felt that Tally deserved that same treatment. Uh, we wanted her to be based on a real person because there are people for whom that relationship is as important as the relationship with Liara or Miranda or any of the other love interests. Yeah. Patrick wrote Tally and he's very passionate I have about a, it. I have a vested interest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, kind of one final question. This one keeps popping up. Uh, do we have any comments about the indoctrination theory? <laughs> Okay, so first of all, the indoctrination theory kind of illustrates, again, um, how committed the fan base is. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing. We, we, the thing is, we don't want to comment either way on it, and here's why. We, we don't want to be prescriptive for how people interpret the ending, um, especially with the extended cut DLC coming out. We don't want to, um, again, be prescriptive with how people should think things ended. Uh, we want the content to speak for itself. And uh, we'll, we'll let it do so. So that's all we'll say. Cool. Uh, well, I want to get the, some of the rest of the team here uh, involved in the panel as well. Uh, Alex. Uh, Alex is, a, as I mentioned, a level designer. Uh, he's also kind of a fact checker and information buff. And I uh, know you've got some stats and that sort of thing you wanted to pass out. Absolutely. Um, so as we were preparing for this panel, I uh, poured over the content from ME1 to ME3, trying to get a feel for, for how our content has evolved over time. And I hadn't realized uh, how crazy we are. <laughs> um, let me give you a couple of numbers. So let's start with something really concrete. You all know the Normandy, right? I contend that the Normandy, Normandy is probably the most complicated piece of content ever created. Um, we've had the same designer on it for three games, and thank God, because I don't think anybody else could stomach that. Uh, just to give you a couple of numbers to keep things in perspective. So in ME1, there were 136 conversations on the Normandy. A yeah, substantial amount of content. Uh, that bumped up to 172 on ME2. In ME3, there are 300 conversations that occur on the Normandy. Um, and that's 150 of them are ambient conversations that go on, whether you interact with them or not. But 150 of them are full conversations. And some of these are multi-part. So that turns out to hours and hours and hours. I mean, across the entire game, um, I, I, I talk to our localization people. I've got some crazy numbers. I mean, we've got literally um, 300,000 VO words that were recorded, and that's in seven languages. <laughs> so we've got a team of 21 translators who in total about, well, translate about four million words. Um, I mean, just if you just look at a single language, we've got the equivalent of about seven and a half novels worth of text in this game. Um, it, it just dwarfs when you start thinking about these numbers. I mean, as a designer, we get to, as a, you know, uh, I get to play with a lot of different assets created by artists, created by animators, um, and created by writers, obviously. Just in the Normandy, there are about 15,000 nuts and bolts. Like 15,000 pieces that were put together lovingly by hand. That also need to be tested. <laughs> <laughs> and written. Um, so again, just to try to see the evolution of Mass 1 to Mass 3, I got a few other interesting numbers. So the design team, for example, you could expect that, well, if we've been doubling almost every single time, the design team must have you know, tripled or something. Well, actually not quite. We started out in Mass 2, we were about 23. I can't actually take credit for that. I wasn't actually there at the time. Um, in ME2, we were 55. In ME3, 57. 
So we basically almost did the double amount of work <laughs> in the relative amount of time. But, but there's good reasons for that. Obviously, the difference between Mass 1 and Mass 2 were probably a little more obvious from, from the user perspective. And the difference between Mass 2 and Mass 3 may be a little more subtle. But from our end, we see it as a lot more content, <laughs> which is actually great to work with. Um, again, a couple of extra numbers. Number of plot values, the number of variables that designers play around with has increased insanely. Started off with about uh, 3,500 different plot values in ME1. And, and some of these are really, really minor. Have you completed this combat, for example? Um, in ME2, we bumped that up to about 6,400. ME3's got 15,000 plot states. Thank you for yeah. being such good quality assurance is all I can so say. <laughs> um, obviously, one of the things that we've, we've, we've voluntarily tried to push from ME1 to ME3 is digital acting. I mean, we, we like to breathe life in our characters. Um, and one of the ways we do that is, is by creating a set of rules that help us determine how an, a, a digital actor transforms from one emotional state to the other um, to give you know, performance. Uh, in ME1, the system we had uh, had about 3,000 rules to determine what should be playing at any one time. In ME2, five times as much, 15,000 rules. ME3, 64,000 rules to just, just to handle animation in a digital acting environment. You know, and, and I might want to add that we kind of created this problem for ourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's, this is what happens when you leave a, an open-ended game uh, with variable plot states. Each progressive game, you you make things infinitely more complicated, and um, yeah. So that behind all of these things, Mass Effect Three was the culmination of all of those plot states, all of those variables, all of those things, and uh, you know that's that's partially why we got we got screwed in the end. Really, <laughs> it was it was difficult to do, and because of that, we had to work double as hard. So when we had the designers basically, you know, double the team, it's because they were they were not making it double the levels, but because they were making it double the content. Um, if you play Mass Effect Three a number of times, you'll see a number of different things, just like Mass Effect Two. Yeah, I think you, 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 I think the one thing that I'd like to insist on is that ME3 has probably three or four times the amount of conditional content that ME2 had. Um, because we were building on all the choices of ME1 and ME2, we had to painstakingly choose from an immense list of, of choices. And obviously, we couldn't address every single one. I mean, it's just not feasible. It's just not feasible. But I think that... Um, with the design team and with the writing team, I think we came up with a set of important decisions, and sometimes not the decisions that you expected, which is quite voluntary, um, to try to make Mass 3 as much your story as it is ours. And, and I, I think we were fairly successful in that. Cool, thank you. Uh, but yeah, speaking about the story, uh, I'm gonna get you know our writers here involved a little bit. Uh, you know, there were themes and story elements that carried over from one into two and two into three across the whole arc. A couple. <laughs> yeah, one or two. Uh, as was mentioned, some of, and there are going to be spoilers. Just mentioning that. Uh, <laughs> Some of the things uh, that we that were common theories uh, or themes that were discussed, one of them was the challenge of the genophage. Uh, the genophage, uh, for those that don't remember, was the disease that essentially rendered Krogans unable to reproduce. It was a massive... If you don't know what the genophage is, you're sitting in the wrong room right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about you know the challenges of the genophage sure. the characters um so i uh 2007 i was a lot like you i suppose out there i was just a big fan of bioware went out bought mass effect one day it came out loved it had a great time with it and i remember thinking to myself wow this this genophage issue is pretty complicated i, I wonder how bioware is going to wrap that one up <laughs> so 2010 i'm working for bioware and they're like don bro you're wrapping up the genophage issue I'm like what <laughs> Um, but I realized, well, that means I get to write Rex, and that means I get to write all these cool characters, and uh, all right, oh, how am I going to do this? Because it's, it's a complicated idea that's full of a lot of politics, science, morality, and I realized 
in a lot of these cases, the best thing you can do is focus on the characters, which is what Bioware does well. And I felt it was just really a stroke of luck that up to that point we'd never revealed what female Krogan looked like. It was something of a mystery in the IP. And I, it just struck me one day, which, well, here's the perfect way for the female Krogan to make her entrance with Eve, as she's known in the game. And we focus it all on her. We make it up, the, the cure to the genophage will all be about her character, her hopes and dreams for the Krogan. I wanted to bring that in. Uh, so I wrote the mission, and actually Alex helped on the mission that you've all played, I'm sure, where you rescue her on Sir Kesh. Uh, and then we get back to the Normandy. We find out that there's this other side to Krogan. I wanted her to represent, you know, where the males are always about war, violence, war, more violence. I wanted to show that there is another side to the Krogan. That, because the trick is, face value, the Krogan, I don't know if they really deserve a cure given that it's always war, violence, war, violence. And, I, <laughs> and in the character of Eve, I saw an opportunity to present, nope, there is another side to the Krogan. They, they are worth saving. And that's, that's an, uh, an idea that I wanted to weave in throughout the whole genophage arc. So when I started writing the Tuchanka mission, where you actually go to cure the genophage or not, uh, it was a terrific collaborative effort, I think, with myself, cinematics, uh, design, art. I wanted the city that you saw on Tuchanka to reflect the fact that the Krogan weren't always, you know, this violent, warmongering species. Once upon a time, they actually had culture. Um, I wanted to present the choice up front, which isn't something we always do, but you know going into that mission, you're going to have to decide, am I going to cure the genophage or not? And I wanted to to then weave that choice throughout the mission so it's always on your mind. Um, it's this thing weighing on your conscience. Um, so when you, you get to the end, you've seen what the city looked like. You've heard Eve talk about her hopes for the Krogan. You've heard Rex or Reeve talk about their ambitions. Um, which in fact was the next challenge of it was all the choices and plot states they talked about. So you could go into this with, uh, well, how many people played it with Rex? Okay. How many people played it with Reeve? All right. Not as many. How many people played it with both? <laughs> so not as many played with Reeve, but he's out there. So that, that's a situation you have to address. But it was an opportunity to show with, with Rex as the leader, maybe there's more hope for the Krogan. With Reeve as the leader, it's a little, a little iffy on how the Krogan are going to turn out. Um, so of course, I'm developing this mission. As I started writing it, I'm realizing this, the spaghetti I'm tying myself up in, which is I've got Reeve talking to Morden, but Morden could be dead, who's talking to Paddock Wicks, who's the alternate for Morden. Uh, His name. <laughs> Patrick Weeks, Paddock and Wicks, anyway. Um, so that became a, just a logistical and technical challenge, is having all these potentially dead characters talking to potentially other dead characters. Um, <laughs> But Welcome to Bioware. <laughs> get, getting into that notion of, of fan feedback driving our process, I know a lot of people felt Rex, they wanted more of him in Mass Effect 2, and we're hoping for more of him in 3. So I felt, all right, let's try and make that happen, despite you know, the complications. Just believe me, loading these characters in memory, getting all these guys in the same scene is quite the feat. And I, my hat's off to our designers for making that all happen so we could have all that great character interaction. Um, then the, 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 the ultimate challenge, of course, is how are we going to pay this off? How's this final moment going to happen? And I'd been imagining for well over a year and a half the sequence of events where someone's going up a tower, someone's going to release this cure, it's going to be this magical, awesome moment, the music will be there, and just kept, it's like just kept envisioning it. Every day I came to work trying to bring this to life. Um, and I knew it was going to work because early on I'd been going through some story concepts we'd all jotted down. And Patrick, who wrote Morden in Mass Effect 2, had written down Morden should come to some sort of noble end. It was just an idea out there. And I saw that, we got together, and we suddenly realized what we could have there at the end. <laughs> which, for, <laughs> which for Patrick was, 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 I think, quite the opportunity to pay your character off. Yeah, I was... Uh... I was really excited about Morden. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> so for me, Morden is is two different characters. Um, the first character is the one I was given uh, when I came on to Mass Effect Two, and I was told he's the scientist who redid the genophage. 
And my initial reaction was um, unrecordable, but translated <laughs> roughly as that jerk, <laughs> because Rex was my bro. <laughs> So I had, I had a choice. I had a, um, in manager speak, I had a problatunity. <laughs> That's right. Very where good. I could either, I could either write Morton as just a guy who did that and went, yep, sterilized him. <laughs> and you know, maybe the really renegade players would like that, um, but everyone else would just go, I'm never using him. He's atrocious. He's a war criminal. How could you do that? Or I could challenge myself more and try to write someone who saw himself as good. Someone who saw himself as the guy who made the hard choice. Um, who didn't take the easy way out, doesn't cartoonishly justify anything he did, but gets up every day, looks in the mirror, and says, it was the right thing to do, even if I am sorry I had to do it. And that's what I tried to bring to him. Um, and then the other part of him is, is the Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which I, re I remember the day we were like, so how's Morton really going to go out? He's going to well, be singing. It's going to be, it's going to be singing. Yeah. So obviously the ending had to capture both of those parts of him. Um, so for the room. The interesting thing for us is that what we really, um, uh, John is possibly giving me too much credit, I didn't write the last scene with Morden, uh, we wrote it together, you know, I, I did some of the worst. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but really, when we say the last scene with Morden, it's really about three scenes, because the first scene is, you told Morden and Rex or Reeve, if you, you know, couldn't save Rex on Vermeer, you monster. Um, as soon as you possibly could. So, so show of hands, um, who told Morden and Rex Arif in the truck? In, there you go. Good people. Well, that's what I'm talking but, about. But if, you, if you had Reeve, who, who told Reeve? Yeah, really. Uh, see, yeah, like, uh, okay, yeah. Know. There's going to be a sea of blood and we're going to roll over. over and like, war, war, war. Well... <laughs> Maybe that genophage is not a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so that's the first scene. And that is a, a wonderful, um, we tried to write that, I tried to write that as just a sad, a good send off for a good character. Um, he was doing what he wanted to do and you were his friend who was helping him do that and he did go out singing and uh, I'm incredibly impressed by our cine designers and cinematic animators. Uh, we hate doing hard interrupt cuts and we specifically said I am the very model of boom <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah we asked for that. That was <laughs> Even as part of the team, when uh, I first played Mass Effect 3 and got to that point, I dropped my... I was... No! I got really upset. Yeah. Stormy. So, but then there's another scene. What if you didn't tell him? And that scene is almost completely different because the emotional context is different. Um, maybe you're just revealing it to him there. Maybe you are, uh, maybe you don't reveal it. How many of you tried to lie about it to him? How many of you told him to go away, told him he wasn't going up? Yeah, um, that, that, that was a... And that was hard to write. And it was a, we didn't immediately have a choice in there. We knew there was going to be a choice, mm -hmm. but the form it would take, we weren't sure. And I remember thinking, all right, well, you could sabotage the cure. All right, that, that sounds good. There'll be a way for Shepard to sabotage the cure. Um, and it was actually Mac Walters, our lead one day, who said, well, what if in order to sabotage the cure, you have to kill Morden? And I came to Patrick. I'm like, well, Patrick, what do you think? I think with any other follower, I would have said, you know, holy God, no, why? That's... But in a way, we'd actually laid the groundwork with Morden. Uh, in Mass Effect 2, Morden is 
possibly one of the only characters who will stand up to you, and not in a I am big enough to fight you way, but in an I believe in what I'm doing enough to stand up to Commander Shepard. <laughs> Um, so, you know, he's one of the only followers that I can really see getting into that kind of standoff with. And Morden, you know, he, Morden never draws a gun. He doesn't think he's going to take you. But he believes in what he's doing enough to say, if you have to pull the trigger, do it, but I'm not stopping. Um, yeah. And yeah. wow, that was hard to write. <laughs> <laughs> so who pulled the trigger? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Okay, everyone, look around you. Look at the hands that are up. We're the best. There you go. Just there you go. Just just keep your eyes on those people. <laughs> Don't turn your back on them. Um, mostly, I this was a scene that I could never have written on my own. Uh, I was honored to be able to work with to, with John to to uh, to help with it. Um, because it really is the, the work of so many different people coming into that. Um, John and I also kind of work together um, on the person who makes you feel even guiltier if you sabotage the genophage later, uh, Garrus, who I don't know. Who talked to Garrus after sabotaging the genophage cure? Yeah. You go up and talk at the front of the cockpit, he's like, yeah, I would have been tempted to do something. But boy, you'd be cold-blooded to do cold that. Vein, yeah, you, ice running in your veins, yeah, and yeah. Shepard just says, I guess we'll never know. Yeah, that was... <laughs> That was dumb, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 Garrus, uh, Garrus was a great character to write. Um, uh, Mac Walters had, as I believe Mac had written him in part one, set up a great character there. Patrick then ran with him in two. Patrick set up a lot of the seeds for then what I was able to do in three, especially with the uh, Femme Shep romance. The, the whole. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was then taking Garrus to the logical conclusion, which I think I remember pitching that my take was going to be Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. This was going to be this is going to be two two guys who really come to be you know best friends, really, right? Potentially lovers. Uh, John is also being, I think, a little modest. Garrus, Rex, and Javik. So if <laughs> so, if you ever want. If you ever need a bro to be written, <laughs> you'll want to go to Dumbro. <laughs> well, it was like I, like I said, back in Mass Effect 1, I was a fan like everyone out there uh, sitting here today. So Garrus was a, a terrific character to play. So when I got the opportunity to write him, I, just, I wrote the way I thought fans probably wanted it to end, which was on this um, amazing note of friendship, I suppose. So that scene up there in the rafters... Um, yeah! So... <laughs> That, that was really, that was, uh, what is it, uh, necessity being the mother of invention. <laughs> so I knew I had to write a scene with Garrus, and I'm like, it's going to be at the Citadel, but man, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? So I'm in the game, walking around, and I'm looking up there going, I wonder what's up in the rafters. And uh, hmm, wait a minute, Garrus might know. Hey, and the whole idea of a bucket list came together, uh, which turned into a shooting contest and cinematics, and Art was looking at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, ah, you know, the fans are going to love it. You'll see, you'll see. Um, but I'm curious who 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 let Garrus win that shooting contest. <laughs> so who didn't let Garrus? Oh, really? <laughs> That's pretty good. I could, I could great spirit of honesty, you know. The 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 other great aspect to Garrus, of course, was I, as I understand it, there was a lot of feed, fan feedback in uh, Mass Effect One wanting to be able to romance Garrison Two, which Patrick then did in Two, I think rather well. And all I had to do, I think, was just take that all the way home and give you the big sweeping, you know, Hollywood gone with a kiss, we used to call it up there in the rafters, to, <laughs> to finally bring the romance where it should be for the final game. So I got to credit, though, Patrick for starting that whole. I just awkward... did a head bump. That was. <laughs> yeah. We got the full motion captured kiss. <laughs> but uh, the thing about Garrus, of course, is he's only one of two characters who've been with Shepard and squad mates the whole time. The other being Tally, which... Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'll let Pat talk about Tally for a little bit because she's actually... Uh, my favorite two characters in the game are the elusive man and Tali. Uh, so we're going to talk about Tali, uh, but we're going to, about five minutes, because we do want to make sure there is time for questions from the fans, so, okay. Tali, 
Zora Naraya. <laughs> and then Vast Normandy. <laughs> you know, we weren't sure we were going to be able to do that. Um, it was actually one of those spur of the moment things where we said, what if, could we actually change her title card? Can we do that? And they went, and I think the gameplay guy said, well, it's kind of a pain in the butt, but, oh, you want to change to Vast Normandy? Well, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> um, sometimes asking for the impossible, you just have to explain why it's going to be cool, and then <laughs> and the impossible gets a little easier. <laughs> Tally, uh, Tally and Garrus were uh, my two, were the first people I got the uh, they were with you all the time achievement for in Mass 1. <laughs> and so they were my faves. Um, not that we have faves, we're completely impartial and professional <laughs> about all of our characters, even my waifu. Um, <laughs> so in Mass Effect 2, I got to take her um, on a journey and share a little bit more about Quarian culture. In Mass Effect 3, uh, Tally is, if she's alive and you're not a monster who got her killed, uh, the lens through which you see Quarian culture. Um, and it's one of the reasons I really love Tally, because she's flawed. Um, I think a lot of people think, uh, I've seen people say, oh, she's just perfect, and she's not. And, you know, I wrote her, so... <laughs> uh, I, I'm saying that. She's, uh, she's racist. She grew up in a very racist society that has had several centuries to tell its version of what happened with the Geth. Um, and that doesn't mean she's a bad person. It just means that's where she grew up. That's the, ex that's the life experience she had was sitting around the holographic campfire telling ghost stories about uh, the morning war. She has an unrealistic willingness to sacrifice herself for the fleet by human standards. Um, she has a father that even in death she's trying to prove herself to. And that's what Quarian culture is. Um, so for telling the, the story of the Geth and the Quarians, we really wanted to establish that. We needed to establish, um, just on a, on a sheer logistical level, if you were new to Mass Effect 3, trying to give you any kind of reason why, between the Geth and the Quarians, you would side with the ones you'd been fighting for the past several hours. Because you, we, knew we, we knew you were going to fight the Geth. They're fun enemies to fight. They make the blinky sounds. They, <laughs> they shoot fast. They have a lot of shields. So they're, they're fun to fight. I like them. But you know, if we're going to let you fight them for two hours and then say, or you could side with us, how does that work? And so the way we decided to do that and the way we had to do it was to show that the Quarians were flawed as well. Um, and that they were too passionate, too emotional, uh, that they are a deeply spiritual people who care about their home world, but are also willing to do sometimes atrocious things. Um, who punched Admiral Garrow? You made the right call. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so coming down to that, that Tally's story, even Tally's romance really is the romance, you know, she doesn't have a big date on the Citadel. Your date is getting her her home world. Uh, that was kind of the way we thought about it. that last conversation, sitting on the cliffs, looking at it, everything. You know, that was for Tally, that was coming full circle, and that was really the experience I wanted to get across. So there we go. Uh, we, we are starting to run out of time. We've been talking too much. Uh, <laughs> So we, we do want to open up the floor to some questions. Uh, we, we've kind of run out of time. If you have a question, we're, we've only got about 10 minutes or so, unfortunately. If we do not get to your question, please come to room 105. Talk to us. We do want to talk to you. Uh, please limit yourself to just one question. And by one question, not I've got one question with eight different parts to it. So uh, please, go ahead, sir. Your first there's, question. There's a mic over there. Yeah, you're on. <laughs> all right. Just want to say, uh, first of all, I was introduced to Mass Effect because I had to play for a class assignment. <laughs> <laughs> you take the best classes. <laughs> uh, it's a school in Montreal, so <laughs> yes, Montreal. Uh, I wanted to know something. This is not something that is part of the ending, but this is something that I always thought about towards the end of the game. 
Uh, when the Citadel was moved, what happens to everybody? Is, is it instant death? Did some people get out? Everyone on the Citadel, you mean? Yeah, like, oh. did the Citadel Defense War Asset help with anything with that? Or? Yep, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we established, I think it's in the Citadel Codex entry, is that um, definitely any place inside has emergency seals, and even some of the exterior areas have the same, uh, mass, uh, the same kinetic barriers that are used to stop air from escaping. Yeah, we actually see this in ME1 near the end, when yep. you're actually fighting on the external surface of the Citadel. Yep. So. Um, even if the Citadel is destroyed, and if I remember right, in the, uh, in the control ending, it's not destroyed, but even in the ending in which the Citadel is destroyed, it's not like the entire thing blows up. Like, there's definitely going to be casualties, but you see the arms come off into large sections, and there's no reason that everyone on those is dead. Uh, you know, when, when we were writing role-playing plots or, you know, the, the post-traumatic Asari or any of the flavor ambience. We wrote those assuming, you know, yeah, there's going to be a loss of life when the Citadel is hit by the Reapers um, and then when the Citadel is used in the end game. But you can assume a lot of those people are still alive. You know, they were, they were indoors, they were behind a kinetic barrier. So, so oh, not too bad. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Next, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is a bit more of a philosophical question uh, relating Ooh. to the in entire context of the, the ending, um, which is, it, as an art form in games, shouldn't the integrity come from its capacity to uh, withstand all forms of criticism, not just constructive? Um, because a lot of the, like in Dr. Music, uh, Musica's letter, he said, we only want constructive criticism, but isn't this integrity about having all kinds of criticism and, and taking it and addressing it? <laughs> well, you know, I'm. Cool. Sorry, it's okay. Whenever you create a piece of art, I mean, you're, you're never going to have everyone who's extremely happy with what you do. You know, there's, there's always you know, bits and pieces. The only reason we ask for it to be constructive, and I, I do the quotey things because if constructive can mean a number of things, as long as it's not belligerent. And if it's belligerent, that's entirely up to the, to the feedback giver. Um, but when we're listening for things, we're actually looking for, for ways to improve. Um, that's kind of the, the line that we draw. We, we, we would like ways to improve. We would like ways to make things better. If you didn't like the ending, you're entirely okay to not like the ending. But, you know... Doesn't it, make it a crime against humanity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's why we, we really just want constructive because, you know, you can give us whatever you'd like, but we still want to be action on that feedback. So thank you very much for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, hey. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the scene where you shoot Morden is actually really, really well done and really kind of beautiful, the way that he like crawls up and there's blood following and everything. It's really sad, but it's really nice, that's, well, that's too. That's quite a beautiful... Yeah. Um, it's, it's very nice. I um, remember... It's the, shoot, it suits his character. The so. first time our cinematic designer showed us that scene, it, so he starts at the Renegade Interrupt, um, there was a bug, a glitch, where everything went into slow motion. And we're like, that's not a bug. Keep it. <laughs> so yeah, it was really I could, his name's John Ebinger. He spent a lot of time working on that. And he's the one that put it in the crawl. And we all saw that. And we're like, oh, God, Morton's crawling with the blood. And we're even crying. So glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really nice. But my question was, um, this is actually completely unrelated. But back on Ilos, we saw statues of these tentacle people. Right. Yes. Are those the Protheans? Because we see Javik, and he's not that so, at all. So... <sighs> Potentially, we've contradicted ourselves a few places here, so... <laughs> really? Yeah. No. Um, the first time that's ever happened. So I wrote, Javik has a line where he talks about the Protheans built upon the ruins of another civilization that came before them. So, unless another writer contradicted that, <laughs> Patrick, I believe that those statues are the civilization that came before the Protheans. Could be. Yeah. I just or, assumed they were being artistic. Who knows? Thank you very much. So, as a software tester, I wanted to give the uh, Q&A guy a little love. Um, <laughs> what kind of tools did you guys use for testing? Are they in-house, or do you use any third-party kind of tools? 
Uh, the majority of stuff that we use for testing is in-house stuff. So for instance, with the massive amount of uh, plot states that Alex was talking about earlier, uh, we have our, our own internally developed plot state editor, which is a giant scary thing uh, that in Mass 3 includes all of the plots for Mass 1 and 2, and then also for 3. Uh, yeah, so going through there and, uh, and and making sure that everything is straight uh, and importing properly is, is a, a whole deal. Uh, trying to think of some of the other uh, internally developed tools that we're using. I mean, all, all of our testing structure, stuff like that, our, our, our test plan stuff, it's, it's all internally developed. So by and large, it's, yeah, it's all internal. It's kind of hard to generalize with the type of content that we make. Not a lot of other people have the same type of challenges that, that yeah, we have. So. Right, thank you. Yeah. Hey, guys. I heard with the new, uh, the ending DLC, I've heard conflicting things about whether or not it's just going to be more cutscenes, or is there going to be actual gameplay included in the new endings? Um, right now we're planning extended cinematics, um, and we don't really have anything else to say about it. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Keep giving us your feedback. Uh, if you each could throw one character into the synthesis ending, which would it be? So wait, say again? If you could throw one character other than Commander Shepard into the synthesis ending, who would it be? <laughs> I'm Marauder not, Shields. I, so I heard Conrad from the audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, we listen. <laughs> On your end? I, I, no, I heard I Conrad, and I'm going to go with that one. Yeah, that's good. One. <laughs> he deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> hey guys, this is kind of a what if question. Uh, we established in Mass Effect 3 that the Protheans were the reason that the Asari became a very dominant race in the galaxy. And my question is, had they not done so, would the Asari have been doomed to extinction? What with their uh, breeding within themselves, creating the Ardat Yakshi, would that have doomed them ultimately? I don't think so. No, I don't think it would have doomed them. I just think they probably wouldn't have been the first race to discover the Citadel. Um, I could see the Salarians probably discovering it first with their curiosity and their, uh, you know, exploration and expansion urges. Maybe they wouldn't have been blue. I had a line in there about Javik saying you once were green, but I took that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they were always blue. Hello. Uh, so my shepherd didn't uh, romance either Tally or Garrus. So in my ending, they were together. Um, I'd love to hear a little about uh, why you decided to do that and why it was a little hidden. It wasn't easy to see that scene. Huh. So that's Patrick. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> you know, again, it, it really came out of the fact that they were just the uh, the two followers who had been with you the whole time. Uh, part of it was because they were the the two Dextros on board. Um, they could eat the same food. And they'd always had um, this kind of bantering, bickering relationship that, um, if my marriage is any indication, is the formation <laughs> of most relationships. So I just, it came out of the, I threw in as an Easter egg, the banter between Garrus and uh, Tally on the Citadel um, in Mass 2. And um, I just saw that and went, okay, that's pretty funny. What if, they're, what, if they're, what if there's flirtation under there? So that's really all it was. Thanks. Hi, I just wanted to say really quickly that when the credits rolled at the end of Mass Effect 1, that's the moment I remember stopping a guy who owned an Xbox and became a gamer. <laughs> um, just a really quick thing about the end, I just wanted to say amending the end, or not, rather not changing the end, but a expanding on it. I think that's the perfect way to go, because I didn't mind the end. I know I'm in the minority. Um, but uh, with watch, a game like Mass... Please. Thank you. With a game like Mass Effect 3, which I really think it was art, where some games can't... Call of Duty. Um, <laughs> um, this was a really great way of doing it without setting a really dangerous precedent going forward. Thanks, that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Thank man. You. We've only really got time, I'm sorry, for one more question. Uh, <laughs> just, we've got to wrap up the panel and move on, and Mike's got kind of a closing word he wants to pass on to you. So sorry, only one more question. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you guys set the bar incredibly high in terms of the nuance you bring to characters, um, facial expressions and stuff like that, and just being able to produce real empathy. And uh, especially the example that's come up, uh, the tower and 
it was just so subtle and so um, relatable. But there are a lot of times in the game, particularly when there's a really higher emotion. Uh, I'm, the one that really stands out for me is at the end of Mass Effect 2, when he's given that rousing speech, or my, my he, your she, whatever, right? <laughs> but it just, is it, it just seems like for all of the way you just nail it over and over again, and it really is, it's one of my favorite games ever. What is it about those high points? Is it a technology constraint? Is it a directorial constraint? What is it? Is it a mocap constraint? Where the guy's about to tell them to go on a suicide mission and he's a military commander, he doesn't yell. I mean, he speaks loudly and confidently, but he doesn't punch a wall. He doesn't, he doesn't grip anything. I'm just, what's up with that? Because in a game that's filled with so much verisimilitude, you then, all of a sudden, I'm ripped out of it so, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I could say that in a game with, what do we have, for 40,000 lines this time around, um, it's quite the challenge for our cinematic team to have animations that necessarily fit all the crazy things we write. A lot of times we're churning, we're revising constantly. Sometimes they're, they're not given as much time as they would like with a scene. It, it, it's quite the hectic process behind the scenes. The other, the other thing we're I talking about a dozen guys here, right? It's oh, awesome. Right? Everybody, we're, the reason they filled the room is because it's badass. Nobody's debating. I'm just, you know, there's these little slips. Yeah. No, the only other thing I'd add is I think if we had uh, Shepard punch a wall on the Renegade, I'm not sure that would fit everyone, Shepard, who wanted to punch the wall on Renegade. Like, I'm not sure everyone thought, yeah, I was hoping I'd punch the wall on that one. So, <laughs> Shepard is a tough character to write. Um, you know, we get it right more often than we get it wrong, but I've heard, you know, there, the number of times I've heard fan feedback, that paraphrase didn't, like, oh, I thought that would do something different. You know, it's always something we're trying to correct for. But, he's a mili but he or she is a military officer, and we always have to kind of stick within those guidelines for, you know, what we don't think someone would do in those situations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you. Mike has just kind of a closing remark, as it were. Sorry, we, we are literally out of time. Okay. So, so you, you can all come and talk to us individually in the room, like, so that's cool. Um, 105. Come yeah, on down. 105. So before we go, again, I wanted to extend my thanks to the community, to the fans, for supporting us. Without you, we are nothing. We, we are just artists without an audience. We, we discuss what you tell us, you know, if, if, it's, if it's at water cooler conversations, cork boards, you know, between bathroom stalls, anything. It's, it's, it's what you say definitely shows up um, on our radar. So again, I appreciate it. Thanks very much for coming and um, we'll talk to you later, hopefully. Thank you.